I'll try a, a, a short poem by W. B. Yeats, who was very much not a scientist. He was he was a mystic, uh, but this to me um, carries a sort of message of scientific wonder. Be you still, be you still, trembling heart. Remember the wisdom out of the old days. Him who trembles before the flame and the flood and the winds that blow through the starry ways. Let the starry winds and the flame and the flood cover over and hide, for he has no part with the lonely, majestical multitude. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Those of us schooled from infancy in his ways can become desensitized to their horror. A naive, blessed with a perspective of innocence, has a clearer perception. Winston Churchill's son, Randolph, somehow contrived to remain ignorant of scripture until Evelyn Waugh and a brother officer, in a vain attempt to keep Churchill quiet when they were posted together during the war, bet him he couldn't read the entire Bible in a fortnight. He has never read any of it before and is hideously excited. Keeps reading quotations aloud. I say, I bet you didn't know this came in the Bible. <laughs> or merely slapping his side and chortling, God, isn't God a shit? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, better read, was of a similar opinion. The Christian God is a being of terrific character, cruel, vindictive, capricious and unjust. I face two questions. Firstly, is religion true? And second, is it necessary for human psychological welfare or something of that sort? If it isn't true, then for anybody to maintain that somehow humans need it and you're wasting your time trying to get rid of it, what an amazingly patronizing and condescending thing to say. We intellectuals, of course, know that it's not true. But, but, but all, those, all those poor people out there, they need religion. I mean, what a condescending thing to say about, about all those people. Either it's true or it's not. And I have enough respect for people to say that if it's not true, people will reconcile themselves to that and will not find any uh, need for it. Now, I was asked a specific question. Is, there, is it in the genes? Is there some uh, Darwinian reason for uh, religiosity? Maybe there is, but that doesn't bear in the slightest degree on whether it's true. I care about whether it's true. I also care, as a Darwinian, about the origin of it, and I'm interested in the origin of it, and I'm inclined to agree with the um, in implied suggestion of the questioner that it may be that religion itself has no advantage but it may be that it's a byproduct of some other psychological disposition which does. But that is an entirely separate question from whether it's true. And I don't like it when people say, oh, humans need it, or we have it built into us in our genes, or Darwinian natural selection has built into it. Therefore, that somehow validates it. Of course, it doesn't validate it. It merely says that it's been built into us by natural selection, just as all sorts of other probably disagreeable things have been built into us. Doesn't mean we can't try to cure ourselves. Right. <laughs> okay. Can I just? I was singing to myself in the shower this morning, and I felt I realised that it was a, a hymn. I'm a, I'm a cultural Anglican. <laughs> um, I'm not going to sing it now. I, I will. I will just. Um, say, I, I will just say it. Um, it, it's, it's a hymn that we probably all know. Um, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be. I'm afraid the hymn goes off the rails rather after that point. <laughs> 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 um, but um, I think that um, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be, 
that, at least on this planet, and possibly on billions of other planets, but certainly on this one, the laws of physics have conspired to make the collisions of atoms get together to produce nothing that any physicist would have dreamed of, but to produce things like us, to produce plants, trees, kangaroos, uh, insects, and us, to produce collections of matter, collections of atoms that don't just obey Newton's laws in a passive way, they don't obviously disobey them, but not in a passive way, but which move and jump and spring and hunt and flee and mate and think, at least in our case, um, which is a quite astonishing thing to have happened, and we know since 1859 how it happened. Uh, and it's almost too wonderful to believe, but we have to believe it because we now know it's true. It's almost too wonderful to, to believe that um, the laws of physics working through this very remarkable process that Darwin called natural selection has produced these gigantic collections of apparently purposeful beings which look overwhelmingly as though they had been designed. They carry a, a terrific illusion of design which fooled humanity until the middle of the 19th century. Um, now, I think that Darwin's achievement in doing that uh, was not only a magnificent achievement in itself, but it was a, a triumph of science which can be generalized to science generally because once Darwin had solved the problem of how you can get big, complicated, purposeful, and apparently designed things out of very simple beginnings, once Darwin had solved that problem, it then gives courage to the rest of science that the same thing can be done in general and that we shall end up understanding literally everything as springing from almost nothing or according to some modern physicists even literally nothing and I think that that is a, a truly wonderful thought when I say almost too wonderful to be it's a thought that is extremely hard to comprehend and believe and many people have great difficulty in believing it and resort to uh, what in my view is, is an unsatisfactory uh, resolution to the problem, which is to say an intelligence did it. That seems to me to be an evasion of the, of the question, an evasion of the scientific responsibility to understand how things come about, how complicated things come about in terms of, of um, simple things. So I'll stop there for I'm keeping a tally of the people walking out. I think it's about three or four so far. <laughs> One of Einstein's most eagerly quoted remarks is, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. But Einstein also said, it was of course a lie what you read about my religious convictions, a lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world so far as our science can reveal it. As I continue to clarify the distinction between supernatural religion on the one hand and Einsteinian religion on the other, bear in mind that I am calling only supernatural gods delusional. Although I can't recall ever having kissed a photograph, I have wept when reading poetry, when listening to music. I think that those on this side have come to rather resent the suggestion that religion has a monopoly on emotion, on poetry. <laughs> on sympathy, on empathy. Everybody in this room, I dare say, has felt deep grief at the sight or the thought of a suffering individual somewhere in the world, maybe even of another species. That does seem to be something in humanity, to feel empathy with suffering.
and as a Darwinian, I can offer explanations for that. I won't do it now because there isn't time. But it is a travesty that has somehow become widely accepted that if you throw out religion, you throw out the Good Samaritan, you throw out weeping at a sonnet of Shakespeare or at a Schubert quartet. It has nothing whatever to do with religion in the sense of the supernatural. Of course you can redefine religion as covering all these uh, emotional, artistic aspects. And in that case, of course, there's no contest. But I suggest that that's confusing and that we need to define religion as belief in something supernatural. You get your beliefs not from evidence, but from faith, from revelation, from tradition, from scripture, from authority. Now all those are very bad reasons to believe anything. Evidence is the only reason to believe something. And that's the second point that I want to make in closing. Uh, but the first one, the, the main one I, I want to make is that uh, we are all in this together. We are all uh, capable of the same kinds of emotions. We're all capable of wanting to free the slaves and all the things, all the good things that have been talked about. Whether we're religious or not, uh, you cannot give religion the credit for any of those things. They are a part of humanity. The good things are part of humanity, just as the bad things are part of humanity, whether you are religious or not. Um, we are incredibly social animals, as I said before. And, and when somebody does you a good turn, it's important to be grateful. You, it's important to pay back the favor and to express your gratitude. And that, I suggest, might generalize the psychological predisp predisposition to feel grateful when something good happens to you. Might generalize from feeling grateful when a person does something good for you and when the weather does, say, uh, when, um, a, when, a, when an accident happens, when there's an earthquake and your child doesn't die, you feel grateful. And you feel the need to, to be grateful to something or somebody. And, that, and you can't feel grateful to other people because they're not responsible for the weather. So you, so you conjure up a fictitious person to feel uh, grateful too. And that's a special case, really, of the idea that it's good survival practice to suspect agents in nature. A lot of what happens in nature doesn't have an agent deliberately causing it. A lot of it is the weather, a lot of it is the wind, um, a lot of it is just plain accidents that, that happen. But when there are agents around, and where those agents might be lions or leopards or crocodiles who might be lurking in wait for you or might be stalking you, then it's important for your survival to attribute agency to things. And that may generalize even to places where there's no agency. And I've often used the example of uh, a rustling in the long grass, which could be the wind, is actually most likely to be the wind, but which could be a lion. And although the odds are that it's the wind, uh, your best bet is probably to assume that it's a lion. Because if you get the bet wrong, um, it, it, if, if you bet on it being the wind and your bet is wrong, that, then that, that's, that's rather tragic. Um, <laughs> so um, there may be a psychological predisposition to in, invent agencies, invent agents where there aren't any. And this then, this same psychological predisposition generalizes itself to wind gods and thunder gods and, and lightning gods and river gods and, and, and sea gods and things like that, which then become merged later on in cultural evolution into the gods, into the named gods like Thor and Zeus and Apollo and Yahweh. The following offences merit the death penalty according to Leviticus 20. Cursing your parents, committing adultery, making love to your stepmother or your daughter-in-law, homosexuality, marrying a woman and her daughter, bestiality, and to add injury to insult, the unfortunate beast is to be killed too. <laughs> <laughs> the 
You also get executed, of course, for working on the Sabbath. The point is made again and again throughout the Old Testament. In Numbers 15, the children of Israel found a man in the wilderness gathering sticks on the forbidden day. They arrested him and then asked God what to do with him. As it turned out, God was in no mood for half measures that day. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. I would just add to that that um, these, the science of any uh, one century is going to be superseded by the science of future centuries such that if somebody from, say, the Middle Ages were to come, were to be brought back by a time machine to, to now, they would find mobile phones and, and uh, computers and, and uh, jet airplanes, they would be indistinguishable from magic. They would appear to be supernatural. So I am a materialist. I don't believe there is anything supernatural. But don't think of that as a denigration of the natural, because if you were to come back in 500 years' time, you wouldn't have seen nothing yet. The, the physics, the engineering, the biology of 500 years' time will be so far advanced over today's that we might well fall on our knees and worship it as supernatural, but it wouldn't be. It would be the evolved uh, natural. First of all, the very first prophecy is in, Gen uh, in Genesis, and there are many other, um, uh, the whole foundation, if you like, of the base, basis for our faith is the accounts of Abraham are in there. Um, and Abraham? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a Abraham, the one who nearly killed his son. Um, not a very edifying moral story, is it? It prefigures uh, really what the Lord did, uh, offered his son. It does, doesn't it? It does. Yes. They're both as ugly as each other, both the stories. But for me, Richard, when, when you look at the whole Bible and you look at particularly the life of Christ, he had such compassion. He healed the sick, he raised the dead. He wept with those that wept, uh, who were mourning. And Jesus, uh, the character of Jesus, is not at all like I believe that you believe him to be. And he is a, a direct representation of God. Jesus seems to me to have been rather a good man. Um, the story that he gave his life for our sins uh, is a story that was made up later. Uh, and it's a very unpleasant story indeed. I mean, the idea of the scapegoat, the idea... Well, Genesis, let me stop you there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I believe it is, actually talks about that there would be a Messiah that would actually uh, be bruised in the heel, you know, almost put to death, but raised. Uh, the, if you look at that, Bible scholars do, again, uh, say that that is the very first prophecy well, in the Bible time and alluding again, to Christ. Time you come back to a biblical quotation as though I'm supposed to be impressed. I mean, why would you expect no, me I'm to be impressed? No, I'm not trying to impress you, mm. Richard. I'm just trying to give you... I, I'm happy to, for you to have your belief in evolution and long-term, you know, sort of understanding of how we evolved. Well, I would just it, ask you that um, I'm not going to be rude to you. I'm asking you to consider my position so that we c you can see where the, the differences are yes. and perhaps open for discussion. I consider not just your on, position. Not I can just see this your, one. your position comes from reading the Bible. Um, and I've tried to suggest to you that there's no particular reason why you should read the Bible rather than any other holy book which you could get from anywhere around the world. Now, we started to talk about Jesus, and Jesus' um, self-sacrifice, which you pointed out, mirrors that, uh, the, the sacrifice of Abraham's um, son. Now, um, the idea that God could only forgive our sins by having his son tortured to death as a scapegoat is surely, from an objective point of view, a deeply unpleasant idea. If God wanted to forgive us our sins, why didn't he just forgive them? Why did he have to torture, have his son tortured? That's a very good question. Well, what's your answer? Genesis. How does Genesis answer that question? Because Adam was made perfect. And what happened through his disobedience, if you like, simple uh, test and he lost that perfection for us 
for us all as a human race, according to Scripture. And the need for a Messiah or uh, another perfect being of the same degree of perfection uh, could only be the proper ransom for our redemption. God was in a position to accept any ransom he chose, presumably. Why on earth would he have his son tortured for the sin of somebody who lived how long before, for, for 4,000 years before, if you believe that Adam did? Because Adam scrumped an apple. Why would that sin reverberate down the ages and have to be uh, redeemed by the torturing of God's own son? Why didn't God say, I forgive you, I forgive you? It, I, it's in my power to... Be, no, what he said was, my son has to be tortured to death, no. just like <clears throat> Abraham. Any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything comes into existence only as the end product of an extended process of gradual evolution. Creative intelligences being evolved necessarily arrive late in the universe and therefore cannot be responsible for designing it. God in the sense defined, is a delusion. The, the measure of the, fa the factuality of uh, evolution is the same as in any other science. Um, some of the things that scientists have found are found with great confidence. Scientists are always open to uh, the possibility of being proved wrong at some point in the future, but there are some things that seem, at, at any one stage in history, far better demonstrated than others. Um, the fact of evolution is about as well demonstrated as anything we know. It is absolutely certain by the normal standards, the same kind of standards as we are certain that um, the Earth rotates and, and the Sun doesn't go around the Earth. Um, that formally we have to say, well, that, that's a hypothesis that might one day be disproved, but we all know that it won't be. And evolution has now come into that category. I don't mean that Darwin's theory of natural selection, as, at least as the only driving force of evolution, um, that uh, probably should be treated as slightly more uncertain. But the fact of evolution itself, by which I mean the fact that all living creatures that have ever been looked at on this planet are cousins sharing a common ancestor, that is uh, as, as secure a fact as, as, as any in science. There are many Christians who certainly disagree with me on the age of the earth. But let's just go back to the beginnings or the origins of man, which is definitely not where you are coming from as an evolutionist, that man has evolved over millions or billions of years. God says very clearly, uh, let us make man in our image. Therefore, there was a plural as well, and that's where um, Jesus comes into this as well. But that he has stated that he created all things, okay? The book of Genesis and stated day that. Day one, day two, three, and you, goes through You those. said he stated that. The, the truth is the book of Genesis stated that. Yes. Yes, okay. But because the Lord Jesus Christ was there in the beginning as part of the Godhead, um, he could refer to it, and it's not, and I know, I know it would be hard for you to accept this, but, Richard, but Jesus was before he came as a man on the earth. He was before. Do, do, and you, therefore, do you know the evidence for the age of the earth? Do you, do, you, do you know why scientists believe the world is billions of years old? Yes, I hear the arguments, but there are many people like myself, we're not super intelligent but there are those that I said I would love you to to get involved with but I wanted this to be more of um, a sort of a getting to know each other and a trust if you like so that we could carry on with these discussions in, a, in an intellectual way but me as a simple as a simple person there uh, we're looking at the description in the first chapter of Genesis on day one and it uses the Hebrew word yom which is a literal 24 hour days. Now I know some people would say there's a, there's a gap there between Genesis 1 and uh, 2 and 3 and there possibly there could have been um, this evolutionary process that God may have used. Now we know that many of the bishops and archbishops that you say would believe in such a thing but in order to uh, entertain if you like or allow for the evolutionary theory to be expanded upon or, or accepted by other Christians. But just looking at it, uh, are you saying, well, no, of course, uh, 
I know you're not saying, I believe that God created us and that we are intelligently designed and, well, and perfect. Well, I know you believe it, but you don't have any reason to believe it. When you're, you're putting well, everything on this one book of Genesis, no, and you're, I, and you're accepting the, the book Bible. of Genesis because it's part of the Bible, and you mentioned Jeremiah and Micah, and because you see the Bible as a whole, but you know very well that the Bible is a collection of separate books which was, which was put together in a rather random way, and it could easily have been some other account, some other creation myth. The world is full of creation myths, and the Jewish one happens to be um, the one that, that you believe because it got into the, into the Bible, but Australian Aboriginals have another creation myth and all the different African tribes have another one. Every tribe in the world has a creation myth and some of them are quite beautiful. The Jewish one's not at all bad, but why on earth would you believe this particular one just because it happens to have got into the canon, which is the Christian Bible? When, when you feel like it, you will, you will smuggle in magic. You will smuggle in magic for miracles in the Bible. You'll smuggle in magic for the origin of life. I don't, I can't explain the origin of life at the moment. I mean, nobody can. People are working but on it. But you believe that it will have a naturalistic solution? Uh, yes. Uh, I think that it is a cowardly cop-out to suggest that just because we don't yet understand something, therefore it, magic did it. Oh, well, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the God of the gaps idea. Well, but you, that's exactly what you're putting forward, the God of the gaps. You're saying you're pointing to the origin of life, you're pointing to the origin of, of DNA and saying, oh, well, okay, we, Darwin's done everything after the origin of life, but he hasn't done the origin of life. No, that's the God of the gaps. I do not believe that religion is the root of all evil. Thank you, Channel 4. <laughs> Religion is the root of quite a lot of evil, but that didn't make for a very catchy title. <laughs> I just want to briefly reply to Dr. Spivey a couple of points. He says we're fighting a losing battle because uh, religion is a part of our human nature. Well, speak for yourself. It's not a part of mine. And it's not a part of the great majority of my friends in universities uh, in England and the United States and elsewhere. He also said, if we had no religion, how would we do without King's College Chapel, the Sistine Chapel, etc.? Well, you know, artists have to make a living. And in the time when the Sistine Chapel was built and its ceiling was painted, you know who had the money. Artists such as Michelangelo had to go where the patronage was. We shall never know the ceiling that Michelangelo might have painted if he had been commissioned to paint um, the Museum of Science, for example. We shall never know what Haydn's evolution oratorio might have sounded like. <laughs> or Beethoven's Mesozoic Symphony. <laughs> Here we have this phenomenally sophisticated information processor, which is the cell. Am I really to believe that that information processing capacity simply came about by the laws of nature and random processes yes. without a mind? Yes. Well, absolutely. I find that impossible to believe I know as a you mathematician. Do. I know you do. Um, this is called the argument from personal incredulity. <laughs> <laughs> a quote from Kurt Wise, who is an American geologist. He studied geology at Harvard, no less, under Stephen Jay Gould, no less. And he was set for a, a good career as an academic geologist, which all his life he had desperately wanted. The problem was, it came from within, it was his religious upbringing, his firewall of faith. And he couldn't reconcile the two, his scientific education with his religion. And he literally got a pair of scissors and went right through the Bible and cut out every verse that would have to go if he accepted his scientific education. And it, in the end, he decided there was nothing left of his Bible. He therefore tossed out science and said, and from then on, he said, um, with that in great sorrow, I tossed into the fire all my dreams and hopes in science. And he goes on, 
I am a young age creationist because that is my understanding of the scripture. As I shared with my professors years ago when I was in college, if all the evidence in the universe turns against creationism, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a creationist because that is what the word of God seems to indicate. Here I must stand. If religion can do that to a highly educated Harvard geologist, just think what it can do to an average school child or student. Thank you. Now, in the case of the cosmos, freak accident or design, the point that I've made over and over again is that even if we don't understand how it came about, it's not helpful to postulate a creator because the creator is the very kind of thing that needs an explanation. And although it's difficult enough to explain how a very simple origin of the universe came into being, how matter and energy, how one or two physical constants came into existence. Although it's difficult enough to think how simplicity came into existence, it's a hell of a lot harder to think how something as complicated as a god comes into existence, difficult enough to think of how a deist god comes into existence, and even more difficult to think of how a Christian god who actually cares about things like sin and gets himself born of a virgin. It is true that uh, Christianity has adopted many of the best values of, huma of humanity, but they don't belong to Christianity or indeed to any other religion. I think it would be very sad if it were true that you really did need religion in order to be good. Because if you think about it, what that would mean would be either that you get your morals and your values from the Bible or the Quran or some other holy book, or that you are good only because you're frightened of God, because you don't want to go to hell or you do want to go to heaven. Now, as for getting your morals from the Bible, I very sincerely hope nobody does get their morals from the Bible. It's true that you can find the occasional good verse, and the Sermon on the Mount would be, would be one example, but it's lost amid the awful things that are dotted throughout the Old Testament and actually throughout the New Testament as well because the, the idea, the fundamental idea of New Testament Christianity, which is that Jesus is the Son of God who is redeeming humanity from original sin. The idea that we are born in sin and the only way we can be redeemed from sin is through the death of Jesus. I mean, that's a horrible idea. It's a horrible idea that God, this paragon of wisdom and uh, uh, knowledge, power, couldn't think of a better way to forgive us our sins than to come down to earth in his alter ego as his son and have himself hideously tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. Yes, you've exactly. Suddenly, but you've suddenly leapt from uh, sophisticated discussions of the origin of the universe where one can have a proper discussion about whether um, some sort of cosmic intelligence could have set forth the laws of physics. And you suddenly jump to a man who lived 2,000 years ago, was born of a virgin, rose again from the dead. Uh, well, I only did that I, because you mentioned it well, first at the beginning. Well, I think that's petty. I think that's petty. Uh, by comparison with the grandeur of the universe. I mean, to, to put my point again, do you really think that the, the creator of this magnificent edifice of the universe, these, the expanding universe, the galaxies, that he really couldn't think of a better way to get rid of the sins on this one little speck of dust than to have himself tortured? He's the one who's doing the forgiving after all. Couldn't he just have forgiven? I, as an atheist, my friends as, an, as atheists, lead thoroughly worthwhile lives, in our opinion, because we stand up, look the world in the face, face up to the fact that we are not going to last forever. We have to make the most of the short time that we have on this planet. We have to make this planet as good as we possibly can and try to leave it a better place than we found it. Now, to some degree, you've already answered this, but there is a follow-up question. I'm going to go to that now. It's from Rebecca Ray. Okay, my question for you today is, without religion, where is the basis of our values? And in time, will we uh, perhaps revert back to Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest? 
Richard Dawkins, you can answer that and I'll bring in Cardinal Pell. I very much hope that we don't revert to the idea of survival of the fittest in planning our politics and our values and our way of life. I've often said that I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to explaining why we exist. It's undoubtedly the reason why we're here and why all living things are here. But to live our lives in a Darwinian way, to make, up, to make a society a Darwinian society, that would be a very unpleasant sort of society in which to live. It would be a sort of Thatcherite uh, society. Um, and we want to, I mean, in a way, I feel that one of the reasons for learning about Darwinian evolution is as an object lesson in how not to uh, set up our values and our, and our social lives. De deism is, is, as you know, the, the, the belief that no particular personal god, but just some kind of creative intelligence which set the whole clockwork running, set the universe going, and then retired and did nothing more. So doesn't forgive sins, doesn't listen to prayers, doesn't know what we think, has no interest in human affairs, just started the laws of physics going. That's deism. Um, theism is belief in some kind of personal god. Um, such as the Christian God, the, the Muslim God, um, the, the, the gods of Valhalla, the yeah, gods right, of the Olympia right. and so on. Um, pantheism, I've characterized as sexed up atheism. Um, it's sort of, it's kind of what Einstein be believed. He, he, Einstein did not believe in any kind of personal God, but he had a kind of reverence for that which we don't yet understand. And the, some pantheists sort of feel there's a, as a kind of, I don't know, it, it, it's hard to quite characterize exactly what, what, what pantheists uh, believe. Agnostics are people who don't know. That word was coined by Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's friend and colleague. Um, some people confuse agnosticism with thinking there's a kind of 50-50 toss-up, whether there's a god or not. Um, and there's really no reason to, to plump for 50-50. Um, in a sense, we're all agnostic because we can never actually disprove. We can't disprove leprechauns and, and, and pixies. Um, we have to be agnostic about them. But for all practical purposes, we are a leprechaunists and a pixieists and a fairyists. Um, and in the same way, um, we can be we can be atheists while technically ad admitting that we cannot actually disprove the existence of any particular god. I do sometimes call myself an agnostic, but I but I'm I'm a bit wary of that because people sometimes think that means a total non-commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'd rather say that I'm an, I'm an atheist in the same sense as I'm an a-tooth fairyist. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a very important question uh, whether Jesus existed. There are some historians, most historians think he did, some They certainly don't. do. I couldn't um, find an ancient historian that didn't. Uh, well, there are one or two, but I don't really care, actually, because it, uh, precisely because it's petty. I mean, I cannot, I mean, if... You could, you could possibly persuade me that there was some kind of creative force in the universe. There was some kind of uh, physical, mathematical genius who, who created everything. The expanding universe devised quantum theory, relativity, and all that. You could possibly persuade me of that. But that is radically and fundamentally incompatible with the sort of God who cares about sin, the sort of God who cares about what, what you do with your genitals, the sort of God who, who, who is interested, who has the slightest interest in your private thoughts uh, and wickednesses and things like that. Surely you can see that a God who is grand enough to make the universe is not going to give a tuppenny cuss about what, what, what you're thinking about and, and your sins and things like that. So you think that morality is not important? Of course I don't think morality is not important. I'm well, a human it being. sounds like you're saying no, it isn't I'm a important. I'm a human being and I live in a society of human beings and within a society of human beings morality is of course important. But we are one of billions of planets on a huge scale and a cosmic god who bothers about this kind of human scale is not the kind of god that is, is, that is compatible with a scientific view of the universe. It's a medieval view. Why we exist, you're playing with the word why there, science is working on the problem of the antecedent factors that lead to our existence. Now, why in any further sense than that, why in the sense of purpose, is in my opinion not a meaningful question. You cannot ask a question like, 
why do mountains exist, as though mountains had some kind of purpose. What you can say is what are the causal factors that lead to the existence of mountains, and the same with life and the same with the universe. Now, science over the centuries has gradually pieced together answers to those questions. Why in that sense? It's true that there are still some gaps, but surely, Cardinal, you're not going to fall for the god of the gaps trap, I, of saying I, that, um, that religion is going to fill in those gaps which science has so far not yet answered. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, bumper stickers I once saw was, I don't know and you don't either. Well, I don't know and you don't either. I thoroughly approve of that, mm -hmm. especially if when I say you don't either, you're a religious person, because yeah. the, 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 the great fallacy is to say science doesn't know, therefore religion must be right. And that, of course, is a total logical fallacy. There are plenty of things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. There are things that science doesn't know. But if science doesn't know something, there's absolutely no reason to think that religion does know it. We mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that there's a kind of religious default, which we default to when science can't provide the answer. Science is working on the answer. Science, in some cases, may never get the answer, but uh, that's absolutely no reason to think that therefore we default to the religious answer, certainly not. I think there's something wonderful about uh, standing up and facing up to a universe where we are increasing our understanding and we throw away childhood obsessions, we throw away the sort of imaginary friend that comforts us when we're children and we, we feel the need for some kind of parent figure to to turn to. I think when we, when we grow up we need to cast that aside and stand up tall in the universe and it's cold and we're not going to last for it, we're, we're going to die and we, we face up to that and I think that's a nobler way of getting through life than to pin your hopes on childhood illusions. We'll the question back. why is not necessarily a question that deserves to be answered. There are all sorts of questions that people can ask, like, what is the colour of jealousy? That's a silly question. Exactly. Why is a silly question. <laughs> why is a silly question. You can ask, what are the factors that led to something coming into existence? That's a sensible question. But what is the purpose of the universe is a silly question. It, it has no meaning. Now, science doesn't know everything. So it's one of the glories of science that we know what we don't know, and we work on what we don't know, try to shrink what we don't know. It's hard work. We don't cop out by saying, oh, well, if you come to a difficult problem, magic must have done it, or God must have done it. No, we don't say that. We say, right, that's a problem to be solved. It may not be solved this century. It may be solved in the following century, or the one after that. But we don't just lie down and give up and say, oh, well, it must be magic because we don't yet understand it. I would hold up Darwin as a model for the whole of science because before Darwin came along, the whole of life, the complexity of life, the beauty of life, the elegance of life, the apparent design of life looked like magic. And everybody thought it was magic. Everybody thought that God did it. It's so complicated, it's so elegant. Now, that was the really big problem. That's a, that was a far bigger problem than the problem of the origin of life, than the problem of the, cosm of the origin of the cosmos. Darwin solved that problem. All scientists now know that. Darwin solved that problem, and in so doing, he provided us with a sort of parable that don't even think about giving up because if ever there was a time to have given up, it was in the case of biology. Because biology really was a difficult problem, a hard problem. Darwin solved it. Now we have one or two other problems remaining, like the origin of life, like the origin of the cosmos, the origin of the laws of physics. No doubt that there are physicists here who can point to yet other ones. Darwin provides us with a lesson that says, don't give up. Because if Darwin could solve it for the really difficult problem, which was life, then we have every hope that science will solve it for the other problems in the end. And even if it doesn't, even if science doesn't solve all problems ever, that is still no grounds for saying, oh well, magic did it. Can you tell me, 
I think you said you actually were quite religious when you were about 13. You became confirmed and, and you got into religion in a big way. And then when you were about 17 or 18, you became militantly anti-religion. Ex tell me about that well, a little bit. I, I, Was it um, the science that did yes, it for you? Yes, it's yeah. not unusual for a child to be religious. I mean, uh, uh, my parents actually weren't, but but nevertheless, um, my schools were, and I, I was confirmed, and everybody at the school was confirmed. I think there was one boy who was a Roman Catholic family, and, and, and he, he wasn't. Perhaps he was confirmed into the Roman Catholic Church, but all, all the rest of us were automatically confirmed into the Anglican Church. Um, so it wasn't a big decision on my part. I just kind of went, went with the flow. Uh, and then was pretty religious until the age of about 15 and then and then gave it up when I found that the the Darwinian alternative which really works as an explanation for the apparent design of living things I was I was a biologist I was very impressed with the apparent design of living things they look designed I mean you know penguins look beautifully designed for swimming very fast through the water uh, they're not designed they've evolved by natural selection and it took me until I was about 16 to really understand that properly, and then I gave up all semblance of religion. In The God Delusion, I made a seven-point scale. One is I'm totally confident there is a God. Seven is I'm totally confident there is not a God. Um, six is, to all intents and purposes, I'm an atheist. I live my life as though there is no God. But any scientist of any sense will not say that they positively can disprove the existence of anything. Um, I cannot disprove the existence of the Easter Bunny, and so I'm agnostic about the Easter Bunny. It's in the same respect that I'm agnostic about, about God. We new atheists are said to be no better than the Muslim extremists who hijack planes and fly them into buildings, or than the fundamentalist Christians who blow up abortion clinics. When was the last time you read of anybody who blew up anything in the name of atheism? not blew something up and happened to be an atheist, blew something up in the name of atheism. The 19 hijackers of 9-11 did what they did in the name of their religion. They honestly and sincerely believed they were behaving in a good and righteous fashion. They believed they were doing what their God wanted them to do. They believed that they were going to a martyr's reward. They believed it because it followed logically from what they had been taught in their faith schools. Atheism doesn't have any faith schools. If we did, by the way, we wouldn't teach them atheism, we'd teach them critical thinking and how to make up their own minds. I have experienced plenty of things which could be called transcendental. I've experienced the feeling of almost mystical wonder that I get when I look up at the stars, look up at the Milky Way, uh, contemplate the galaxies receding from us, listen to a Schubert quintet, uh, read a sonnet of Shakespeare. These are all things which only a human mind is capable of doing. So may I ask you? Let, 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 okay, sorry. Only a human mind is capable of doing that. And a human mind is capable of doing those things because the human mind has been put together in the brain put. as a highly complicated organization that has evolved over some four billion years of evolution, putting together nervous systems. It is a stunning achievement of evolution to have put together the human brain, the human brain that is capable of being moved by such things. I yield to no one in my capacity to be moved by what you call the, the transcendental. What I do not do, however, is to indulge in mystical nonsense about it being there before there were brains or the equivalent of brains. Is it okay to tell a child that God doesn't exist? Richard Dawkins. I think it's okay to tell a child the truth. Uh, what I, but I would prefer to um, encourage a child to make up her own mind and to think uh, about the evidence and to believe things when there is evidence. What I think is not okay, what I think is deeply immoral, is to tell a child that when she dies, if she's not good, she's going to go to hell. That seems to me to be mental child abuse and an utter disgrace. The question is not whether individual people who happen to be religious or who happen not to be religious are good or bad. Uh, the question is whether religion itself is. 
I think there are aspects of religion which are bad in, in themselves. I think that the idea of blind faith, believing something without evidence, and sheltering behind the right to hold faith, uh, such that you can justify doing bad things because your religion, your faith tells you it's the right thing to do. Many, many good and righteous people who believe themselves to be good and righteous have done terrible things precisely because they believe that they're doing it for their God. So faith, blind faith, can have that bad effect. Uh, for myself as a scientist, I'm accustomed to saying that the things I really object to about religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding teaches us to be satisfied with pseudo-explanations which are really not explanations at all. Things that sound good. <laughs> Things that sound like an explanation but which really aren't, which appeal to the emotions but don't actually explain anything. So I think that religion in that sense can be the enemy of science, the enemy of truth. But this evening I'm reflecting more that what may really be the enemy of truth and the enemy of science is willful obscurantism, whether it comes from religion or not. There is no logical pathway leading from atheism to violence. There most certainly are logical pathways leading from religion to violence. Now, of course, not many religious individuals follow those pathways to their logical conclusion, thank goodness. But there is a logical pathway from the Quran, for example, and it only takes a minority to be lured down it. For atheists, there is no such logical pathway. The nearest we get to violence is in the words we use. And there's a big difference. It's a grave misuse of the word extremism to say that atheists are just as extreme as religious extremists. As Victor Stenger, the physicist, has pithily put it in a slogan that might look well on the side of a bus, perhaps. Science flies you to the moon. Religion flies you into buildings. <laughs> the, the scientists that I respect are scientists who work hard to be understood, to use language clearly, to use words correctly, and to understand what is going on. We have been subjected to a kind of word salad of scientific jargon used out of context with in inappropriately, apparently uncomprehendingly. Um, there is a deep confusion going on here between the properties of things within the universe and the properties of the universe itself. It is one thing to say that the universe contains objects that have sentience and the various other properties that you mentioned. Of course it contains objects that, that have sentience. We are among those objects. So are dogs, so are chimpanzees. The universe contains sentience. The universe is not sentient. This is the one thing, Deepak, you seem not to understand. You're constantly confusing explanations at the level of what goes on inside the universe with the universe itself. It's not enough to say the universe contains sentience, contains purpose, etc. and say therefore the universe is sentient, the universe is purposeful. Evolution, you say, has a purpose, diversity, because what we see is diversity. Of course what we see is diversity. That's the consequence of evolution. But you mistake when you think Time. that evolution is Time. driven towards it. Time is over. Un applauso. How do say? My attitude to science is that we are fundamentally trying to understand how things work. Science is very difficult. It's very difficult to understand how things work. The hard problem of consciousness has been mentioned, the problem of the origin of the universe, the problem of the origin of life, the problem of how life has this uncanny appearance of, of being designed, the size of the universe, the scale of the universe, uh, how embryology works. These are all deeply difficult questions. They require hard scientific work and in all cases, I think I'm right in saying that scientific work consists of explaining complicated things in terms of the interactions 
of their parts or of simpler things. So we always try to explain complex things in terms of simpler things. We do not resort to magical language. We do not snow our audience with highfalutin sounding words that don't actually mean anything. We use words that actually have meaning. We use uh, expressions that can be tested. We work hard at understanding the universe in terms of its component parts. We don't invent superarching entities which have no explanation in themselves. We don't invoke ideas like the universe has consciousness, the universe has awareness, atoms have awareness. If we have a difficult problem like awareness, we explain it in terms of the interactions between small parts working together in ways that scientists understand. If Freeman Dyson ever said atoms are aware, then he's wrong. I don't think he said it. I think he should sue you. Wow. Nevertheless, atheists such as me have been accused of using the language of extremism. We are strident, shrill, intolerant, aggressive, arrogant. We worship the mind rather than the soul, rather than the heart, rather than the gut, perhaps one might say, to parody Charles Moore. And we are accused of giving offence. Well, I think a great deal of this stems simply from the fact that religion has for so long been feather-bedded. Our whole society, the non-religious as well as religious portions of it, has bought into the fiction that it's somehow bad manners to criticize religion. Douglas Adams put it beautifully in an impromptu speech in Cambridge in 1998. Religion has certain ideas at the heart of it which we call sacred or holy or whatever. What it means is, here is an idea or a notion that you're not allowed to say anything bad about. You're just not. Why not? Because you're not. Why should it be that it's perfectly legitimate to support the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, Republicans or Democrats, this model of economics versus that, Macintosh instead of Windows? But to have an opinion about how the universe began, about who created the universe, no, that's holy. We're used to not challenging religious ideas. But it's very interesting how much of a furore Richard creates when he does it. Everybody gets absolutely frantic about it because you're not allowed to say these things. So when somebody like me says something even mildly critical of religion, it is heard as strident and aggressive, even if it's actually less so than would be perfectly acceptable if it were anything other than religion that was being criticized. There's nothing really new about the so-called new atheists. Nothing new in what we say, the only thing new about us is that we speak up and we call a spade a spade. This is not fundamentalism, it's just honest clarity of expression. We use our brains rather than our gut. New atheism speaks clearly. This used not to happen. Atheists were supposed to know their place, to shut up and respect automatically religious faith. I love a quotation from Johann Hari who said, I respect you too much to respect your ridiculous ideas. So entrenched is the assumption, implicitly accepted for centuries by religious and non-religious alike, that religion must automatically be respected, that even clarity is heard as offensive.